All right. Hey guys, welcome to, what is it now? Our fourth week of remote learning. Um, three if you're not counting spring break. Um, well, anyway, this is your video for the week of Monday, April 6th. So what I've done for you guys within the remote learning folder that I already have available to you on Schoology, I've condensed our previous materials from March and I'm going to start organizing it week by week. Um, so rather than front load a lot of the assignments, um, I read a lot of the feedback that you guys gave me during the weekly check-in. So instead, we are just going to take it a week at a time. And we're going to focus on one section at a time. And then for this particular week, you guys will have two additional um, reading assignments on top of that that pertain specifically to the impact of COVID-19 on the economy. You guys will be looking at some current event articles and answering some questions that go along with those. Um, so like I said, I have created a new folder for you guys up here week of April 6th. In here, um, you will find a few things. Number one, this video will be in this folder after I have recorded it, obviously. Um, you also have the PDF that you guys have for your reading. Like I said, um, we are taking this section at a time, so it is um, way less information than you guys had from your last round of assignments. In this folder as well, you guys also have the link to the assignment Google Doc, which looks like this. So like I said, you have two articles that you guys will be reading, answering some questions once you have finished up the articles. So article number one, article number two, and then you will have a third activity, which is just an application of the textbook reading once you guys have finished. Um, so again, I started to look at the feedback that you guys were giving me from your weekly check-in. A lot of you mentioned that you would like to have the option to do um, a video lecture. So what I've decided to do instead is give you guys an option. So if you prefer to independently read, if you like to take notes this way, if this is how you best learn, then you obviously have this PDF available to you to do the reading from. Um, if you don't learn best that way, if you would rather, you know, hear my voice, if you would rather hear a narration going along with the slides, you will now have this option as well, okay? You do not have to do both because it will be the same information. It is solely up to you how you guys would like to um, absorb this content and learn this material, okay? Um, regardless, our weeks are now going to be structured the same way. So every Monday, I will give you guys your assignments. And every Friday by 11.59 p.m., they will be due. Okay, so this is kind of the best of both worlds for those of you who said that you prefer to have a self-paced environment. Um, you can kind of best figure out when you would like to get these assignments done, what works best for you personally. Um, but I did receive some feedback that you guys prefer to, you know, have structure with um, more set in stone due dates. This is how I will structure it for you guys who prefer it that way, um, is that you can expect every Monday you will have your content posted, you will have your assignments available to you, and you know that they are due every Friday. Um, so again, it is kind of up to you when you will get these finished up, when you answer your questions, you do your readings. Um, but again, Friday by 11.59 will be your due dates for those. Um, also, what I will start doing on Tuesdays will be um, a Zoom office hour, if you will. Not necessarily an hour because Zoom cuts me off after 40 minutes, um, but I will post a link to that meeting. If you guys have any questions, you can feel free to just um, quote unquote stop by if you just want to talk for a few minutes, check in, see some of your classmates. Again, you're more than welcome to use that um, Zoom meeting as a platform for that as well. Um, but again, if you have any questions, if you are confused, want some, you know, face-to-face -face interaction, I will be available to you guys for that. Um, but as always, if you have any questions, feel free to continue to reach out to me via 
Schoology, email, remind, you name it, and I will do my best to get back to you as quickly as I can. Okay, um, so that being said, if you prefer to do the reading independently, you can kind of close out of this video right now because I'm going to start diving into the lecture. Like I said, this is only one section of notes, so it is not um, incredibly strenuous. This is not going to take us a super long time. So if you do want to listen to the video and do the reading, you are more than welcome to do both if you feel like that will be beneficial to you. So let's go ahead and get started then. So over the course of the last few weeks, you guys were looking at different types of businesses. You were looking at sole proprietorships, partnerships, corporations, and you guys were comparing and contrasting the advantages and the disadvantages to all of those uh, types of business structures. What all of these uh, organizational structures have in common is that they seek to gain a profit that they are trying to use their limited resources, their limited factors of production, again, in order to be profitable. That is the point of these businesses, whether you are a sole proprietorship, whether you are incorporated or you are in some sort of partnership. Again, the idea is to be turning a profit here. However, that is not true of all types of organizational structures. And that is what we will be focusing in on today. It's going to be nonprofits and other business structures. So before we dive in, I do want to um, quickly go over the objectives with you guys, along with the essential question for the unit. The essential question is why do some businesses succeed and others fail? The objectives, um, first is to identify the different types of cooperative organizations. The second is to understand the purpose of nonprofit organizations, including professional and business organizations. So, like I mentioned earlier, um, most businesses use scarce resources to produce goods and services in the hopes of earning a profit for their owners. Other organizations, however, operate on a not for profit basis or a nonprofit. Um, so, a nonprofit organization works any business-like way to promote the collective interests of its members rather than to seek financial gain for its owners. Um, so an example of a nonprofit is the American Red Cross. Um, they rely very, very heavily on their volunteers um, so that they can, you know, cut back on certain costs. Um, in this way, nonprofits and other community and civic organizations can perform useful services with minimal expenses and without regard for earning a profit. Oops, all right, sorry guys. So there are different uh, subcategories of nonprofits that we'll be looking at. The first is community organizations. So community organizations include schools, churches, hospitals, welfare groups, and adoption agencies. Many of these organizations are legally incorporated to take advantage of unlimited life and limited liability. So looking back to those advantages of a corporation, a lot of community organizations will be legally incorporated, um, but again, profit is not their number one goal. It is not their number one mission here. They are simply incorporated to take advantage of those um, certain advantages. Uh, they are similar to profit-seeking businesses, but they do not issue stock, they do not pay dividends, and they do not pay income taxes. Um, if their activities produce revenue in excess of expenses, they use the surplus to further their work. Um, like for-profit businesses, nonprofit organizations use scarce factors of production. Um, however, their work is, you know, difficult to analyze economically because the value of their efforts is not easy to measure. Their success isn't necessarily linked to a monetary value. Um, however, still, the large number of these organizations shows that they are really important to our economic system. 
So another common type of nonprofit organization we are going to be looking at is a cooperative or a co-op. A co-op is a voluntary association formed to carry on some kind of economic activity that will benefit its members. Um, if you guys look at the chart that I have there on the right hand side, um, you will notice that co-ops can have a variety of goals. Co-ops fall into three major categories, and they are consumer service and producer. I should say, guys, if at any time you need to pause this, if you are taking notes, um, that is not required. But if that is going to help you absorb this information, then you are more than welcome to, you know, pause at any time so you can get down the notes, you can rewind if you need to hear something again. Um, this is really up to you. So first, we're going to break this down um, co-op by co-op, looking at a consumer cooperative first. So a consumer co-op is a voluntary association that buys bulk amounts of goods, such as food or clothing, on behalf of its members. Um, members usually help keep the cost of operation down by devoting several hours a week or month to the operation itself. If it is successful, um, the co-op is able to offer its members products at prices lower than those charged by regular businesses. Um, so an example of a consumer cooperative um, would be a health maintenance organization or an HMO, which provides comprehensive health care for more than 1 million Americans coast to coast, again, typically at um, a lower rate because they are buying into this co-op. Okay, the second type we'll be looking at is a service co-op. Um, service co-ops provide services such as insurance, credit, or childcare to its members rather than goods. Okay, so this is focused on service, obviously, um, as it says in the title. One example is a credit union, um, which is a financial organization that accepts deposits from and makes loans to employees of a particular company or government agency. Excuse me, guys, let me pause this real quick. I'm going to grab a drink of water. All right, guys, sorry about that. Um, so uh, the last type of co-op that we'll be looking at is a producer co-op. Um, so like consumers, producers also can have co-ops as well. Um, so a producer cooperative helps members promote or sell their products. Um, in the United States, most co-ops of this kind are typically made up of farmers. Um, so the co-op helps the farmers sell their crops directly to central markets or to companies that use the members' products. Um, some co-ops such as Ocean Spray uh, Cranberry, for example, they market their products directly to consumers, uh, but they are te uh, technically classified as a co-op themselves. All right, so the next type of nonprofit that we'll be looking at um, are labor unions. All right, so a labor union, um, an organization of workers formed to represent, represent its members, um, interest at various employment matters. Um, the union participates in collective bargaining um, when it negotiates with management over issues such as pay, working hours, health care coverage, vacations, and other job-related matters. Unions will typically also lobby for laws that will benefit and protect their workers. Uh, I believe the one of the largest labor organizations in the United States is the American Federation of Labor, Congress of Industrial Organizations, or the AFL-CIO, which is an association of unions whose members include workers in many different jobs. Um, there's many other unions, such as the National uh, Education Association for Teachers. Um, they're independent and represent workers in specific industries. 
We are actually going to get way more in depth when it comes to labor unions in our next unit. Um, so we are going to keep moving on. But like I said, we will go into more detail on labor unions, how they run, how they operate in our upcoming uh, reading sections. So next, we're going to look at professional uh, associations. So some workers belong to professional societies, trade associations, or academies. Such a professional association consists of people in a specialized occupation interested in improving the working conditions, skill levels, and public perceptions of the profession. So the AMA, or the American Medical Association, um, the ABA, or the American Bar Association, are really good examples of organizations that include members of specific professions. Um, these groups influence the licensing and training of their members. They set standards for conduct um, and are actively involved in political issues that relate to their particular trade or that particular field. Um, other professional associations represent bankers, teachers, college professionals, police officers, and hundreds of other professions. Okay, and next, or last, I should say, we're going to look at business organizations. So businesses is also organized to promote their collective interests. Um, so most communities have a local chamber of commerce or an organization that promotes the welfare of its member businesses. So if you join into this chamber of commerce, you get certain advantages that are meant to promote or help out your business. Excuse me. Um, the typical chamber sponsor sponsors activities ranging from educational programs to lobbying for favorable business legislation. Oops. All right, sorry guys, I lost um, my place in my notes. However, um, some business associations help protect the consumer. So, for example, the Better Business Bureau is a nonprofit organization sponsored by local businesses. It provides uh, general information on companies, maintains records of consumer inquiries and complaints, and offers consumer education programs. Again, that is, you know, meant to help protect the consumer, and it is, sorry, sponsored by local businesses. The last thing we'll be looking at um, from this reading is actually the government and how the government can actually sometimes be seen as a specific type of organizational structure as well um, because the government does have the ability to play a role in the economy, both directly and indirectly. So we're going to start off by looking at uh, the direct role of government on business, on the economy. So many government agencies produce and distribute goods and services to consumers. And again, this gives government a direct role in the economy. The role is direct because the government supplies a good or a service that actually will compete with private businesses. So one example of direct involvement is the Tennessee Valley Authority or the TVA. The TVA supplies electric power for most of Tennessee and parts of Alabama, Georgia, Kentucky, North Carolina, Virginia, and Mississippi. This power supplier competes directly with other privately owned power companies. So as a result, this is a direct role um, from the government. Another example is the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, or the FDIC which ensures deposits in our nation's banks. Uh, because the insurance the FDIC supplies could be provided by privately owned insurance companies, the FDIC is also an example of the direct role of government. Um, however, I don't have it on the slides, but probably the best example or the best known um, government corporation is the US Postal Service or the USPS. Um, originally an executive department called the Post Office Department, the USPS became a government corporation in 1970. 
So many of these federal agencies are organized as government owned corporations. Like privately owned businesses, these corporations have a board of directors that hires a professional management team to oversee daily operations. Um, these corporations charge fees for their products and services, and the revenue goes back into the quote unquote business. Um, unlike private corporations, however, Congress supplies funds to cover any losses that the public corporation may incur. Okay, so next we are going to look at the indirect role of government. Um, so occasionally the government plays an indirect role when it acts as an umpire or, you know, almost kind of like a moderator to help the market economy operate smoothly and efficiently. So one such case is the regulation of public utilities. Um, so municipal or investor-owned companies that offer products such as water, sewage, and electric service to the public. Because many public utilities have few competitors, um, consumers often want government supervision. For example, the federal government established regulatory control over the cable television industry in 1993 because it felt that some operators were charging too much. Without competition, utilities uh, with exclusive rights in certain areas have little incentive to offer services as at reasonable rates, which again um, is why the government kind of steps in and plays that regulatory role in order to help protect consumers from those natural monopolies that are forming. Um, all right, so I believe that is actually our last slide. So quicker section for us to get through. Um, you guys do not have to answer specific, um, you know, comprehension questions for this section. But instead, what I would like you to do is a bit more of an extension activity. So the application of either the reading or the lecture, however you are exposed to this information, what you guys will do is identify a nonprofit organization in your community. So generally, this should be in the Cincinnati area. Um, you guys will need to conduct some research online and then answering the four questions below. So number one, simply put, what is the name of your nonprofit, the one that you have selected to look into? Number two, as what specific type of nonprofit can it best be categorized? So from all the different subcategories that we just looked at, how would you best classify this nonprofit? Number three, what is their mission statement or what is their purpose? So again, we talked about nonprofits, how the purpose is to not necessarily turn a profit, um, but they have some other goal, some other mission. Typically, that is not monetary. I would like for you to discuss it in question number three, please. And then lastly, number four, um, how would the loss of nonprofit status affect the activities and services that this organization provides? Okay, so after you guys have finished up those four application questions, after you've looked at the two articles and answered the questions, you guys can go ahead and resubmit this form back into Schoology and you guys will be done for the week. All right, well, thank you for listening. Um, again, I will see some of you tomorrow at 11 a.m., I hope. If not, like I said, if you guys have any questions, feel free to keep on reaching out to me. Have a good day, guys. Bye.